Hi everyone. Uh, thank you for coming uh, to the Pi Data Track. Uh, my name is Shia, and I came to talk to you a bit about clickstream data and what we can do with it. So uh, I work at Bluevine. Bluevine does, uh, Bluevine, Bluevine does a, a online lending for small businesses in the United States. And we are awesome. And why is that? Because we are accurate and fast. And all thanks to the great automation my team has built, the data science team. Uh, so the vast majority of our decision whether to give a business a loan or not are really automated using our machine learning and statistical models. But there's still some gray area always when we leave the analyst to decide. The research I, I did focuses on this area, the gray area. And the goal is to diminish it, to make it smaller, to make everything more automated. Now, how do we do that? We get more data, more features, more interesting sources of data. And what is more interesting than clickstream? So how can we leverage clickstream, clickstream data? Say, for example, now what is the clickstream data to start with? So it is actually the uh, list of user, the, uh, the list of action the user does in our website. For example, if you have user X that goes to our website and reads everything about the product and goes through all the terms of use and only then goes to the wizard and asks for a loan. And when uh, uh, she does the wizard, she goes through each and every step, go, uh, goes them really fast, uh, types all the details really clearly, everything is great. Uh, on the other hand, we have another user which uh, goes straight to asking for a, a loan in the wizard. And then inside the wizard, it takes him a long time to fill all the details. He goes back and forth. Maybe he, come, he, he stops in the middle and goes back after one day. Um, so what do you think? Do these patterns may have some meaning regarding the future behavior of these clients, of these businesses? I think they do. And the research I, I've done showed that they do. And I'm going to show you how you can take your clickstream data and also make interesting features from it that may say something about the, the goals you want to predict. So let's continue. Uh, our five steps journey will be pretty tr straightforward. This is usually how we do things in data science. First of all, we do some data exploration and we understand our goal. Then we do some cleaning for the data. Um, then uh, uh, this is more specific to clickstream data. After I understood how the flow of each user works, I explored the, the different session of a user, and we will see an example. Um, then uh, you can start really engineering features uh, and check the correlations with what we want to predict. Uh, and then the final stage is to uh, create a model and analyze the results of this model, understand whether this model is actually uh, deciding things from the, from the right reasons. So uh, a bit about our data. Uh, uh, what we do, uh, how we get this clickstream data, we use a service called Mixpanel. Mixpanel uh, helps us uh, record all the user's action in a website even before he completed his re registration using third-party cookies, which is really amazing, I think. I mean, before he even registered, we know everything he did in our website. Uh, and the uh, important note about this uh, tool is that it was meant for product purposes. What we are actually doing with Mixpanel is not uh, uh, analyzing uh, the risk of a user. We are using it to understand whether uh, uh, the flow of our website is good, whether it's usable. So I took this data and used it for a totally different purpose from what it was designed for. Uh, so how does the data look like? Actually, just this is a, an example of a part of data frame. And what we can see here that we have a, a for each row, it's an event in our system of a page that the user visited. And we can see two columns here of different IDs for the users. And we can see the time. And 
that's it, I guess, and, uh, and the URL. And we can see also some kind of an, an event. This is an event, our product. Oh, thank you, Ido. Uh, this is an event, uh, our product defined. And we can also see some uh, additional properties, which are, in my case, was not interesting. Okay. Uh, and now, after I looked at the data, I want to define what is my goal. So, uh, I decided to, to focus on the first stage. This was all a big research product st still. So, the first stage was just to look at whether the user was approved or rejected for funding in the first place. This is the first decision we do about our users. Um, and I just wanted to look only at the actions the user did in our website and based on that predict whether our risk department will approve or reject it uh, uh, without looking at all at the details he provided for us, uh, the usual thing we look at. Uh, some directions I tried on the way, so one that my team uh, uh, proposed uh, and actually uh, tried doing was Markov chain analysis, which is just looking at the transition between pages and modeling them, uh, modeling them with a transition matrix uh, of probabilities to uh, switch from page to page and understand whether these uh, matrices are different for uh, users which were approved and users which were rejected. And based on that, predict whether the, us uh, the, the users are approved or rejected. So this was a very uh, interesting path to go in. In the end, I didn't choose this solution, but I took some insights from it. And the insights I took was that uh, uh, the sequence of the, of the actions the user does matter. It matters if you've been to certain URL or if you've been to a certain URL and before that been to another URL. Okay, so I decided uh, to took that under account in my model and I will show you how soon. The second thing I tried was uh, trying the big buzz of machine learning now, which is deep learning. As you all probably heard, it's, prob it's uh, now possible to analyze sequences using recurrent neural networks, right? Because they have memory and they remember uh, the last state you've been to and they take this under account when you uh, input a new state. So I was eager to try and take my data and put it into an LSTM, which is a, 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 good, a better version of a, a RNN. And uh, uh, it was really interesting. And it worked partially, but it wasn't perfect. And I think one of the reasons it didn't work because Bluevine is, a, as I said, we give loans for businesses. And we have a businesses with cr uh, which we give credit line up to $2 million, which is amazing, amazing data. But we don't have, a, like a, the a ad companies that usually use clickstream data, we don't have millions of clicks every day. We have maybe thousands of clicks uh, every day. So. For RNNs, I think that's not enough in this case. Uh, an additional reason I didn't choose to use this model in the end uh, was that it's actually a black box. You can't really understand what was the most influential features when you just use the sequence uh, of events. Uh, and I was uh, more uh, into understanding what affects my model more, what affects my decisions. So the final strategy which more uh, uh, suited my type of data and my type of decision uh, uh, making was to take my data and do some work, engineer some features, and that's what I'm going to show you with Pandas. Uh, and then after I have these features and I can actually check the correlation of each feature with the target, I can use a machine learning model. And I didn't uh, inspect what kind of model should be the best for this kind of just tried it on my go-to model just to do a proof of concept, uh, uh, so I used ActiBoost. Um, so what kind of feature would you think to build from clickstream data? I mean, as I said, we want to see whether the user, uh, the user is urgent on the money and may, maybe is not consistent with this question, maybe, uh, maybe it takes him a long time to bring the data, maybe he's trying to commit a fraud. So all of these things were in my mind when trying to build the features. Uh, so uh, let's move to step two. Step two, very important, pre-process and clean your data. 
Uh, now I had about 10 gigabyte of data. Uh, if you use pandas, you probably know that that's a bit borderline for using a, a pandas or the group by and, and sort uh, actions. So maybe uh, in the second stage, we should move to some parallel computing library like Dusk or something like that. But for now, I managed to uh, still work with pandas and I use some tricks I will show you soon to make it a bit faster. Uh, in addition, I have all kinds of challenges. Uh, I wanted to ID the users between different actions, so I need to map the two IDs we saw there. And it was very important to understand which URLs repeat between different clients. Uh, now, uh, the URLs were uh, commonly with gibberish in the end, uh, so I had to do some parsing. It was all kinds of user slugs and some marketing keywords I had to eliminate. Um, so I will show you how I use the pandas commands to, to fix that. And there was duplicates I needed to fix. And I wanted to uh, cut the data in the right point because I wanted to predict whether the user is approved or rejected. Now if I will look at uh, user actions from after he was approved, then I will get a leakage, right? Because maybe some of the actions the user can do after is approved, user which is not approved cannot do. So I had to be very careful for, for where I cut my data for each user. It was, wasn't very straightforward. And also I wanted to identify the different user session to be able to separate between different session in order to uh, uh, characterize the different sessions. Say how much is the average session length and how many sessions does the user do uh, before uh, it is approved or rejected. These are interesting things to look at. So, uh, as I said, uh, uh, I had to deal with the URL parsing. So, if you look at the most common URLs, can you see that? Is it clear enough? They look pretty okay. These are the most common ones. But if we look at the less common URLs, you can see that they have all these gibberish in the end. Some of them are user slugs, some of them are marketing words. And what I did to fix that, uh, I just used uh, pandas very efficient uh, street commands, which are ufunks, so they are very efficient, not like apply. Um, and I did all these splits on the symbols I saw which start the gibberish, and I used regex to filter those slugs that are different for each users. And as you can see, it's, everything is very efficient. And afterwards, uh, the last common uh, URLs, as you can see, they have no gibberish, so fixed it. Uh, another thing I wanted to look at is to understand the time difference between each user action, to see how long does it take the user to perform the different actions in our website. So um, if you do that, I mean the native way to do that is to group by each user and then calculate the difference between the timestamps, right? I mean you want to calculate it per user. Uh, but actually, group by is not the most efficient thing in the world. So a, a trick I found to do this a bit faster, uh, even actually 10 times faster, it just uh, sort all my data according to user and according to time and just do diff on the data without group by and then just cleaning the first line of each user. Okay, and then I'll just get all the time differences in order without using group by and it's 10 times faster. Um, after I had the time differences between the user actions, I wanted to be able to distinguish between the different user sessions. For that, I wanted to look at the distribution of the time differences. So I created this nice cumulative distribution. And what we can see from here, that for a, a time difference of a minute, most of the time differences in my data was less than a minute. You can see that 90% of the time differences in my data was less than a minute. And if we see, if we look at the long tail of this distribution, we can see that almost 99%, almost 100% uh, of the time differences were until 30 minutes. And also, uh, I knew that the website automatically logs you out after 30 minutes. So I thought that deciding that a, a user session is a new user session after th a 30 minutes difference is strict enough, and this is what I used in the end. 
And just uh, um, this is how I uh, uh, define the user session. As I said, the time differences are in seconds. And I just say if we have more than 30 minutes, then uh, it's a new session. And then I can also calculate the session number for each session for each user, which is what I do here with this group I. And this is just a nice plot, a different one from one we saw before. Uh, this time it's the distribution of the number of session uh, until decision for each user. And we can see that uh, most of the user has up to uh, seven sessions until they are approved. Um, and uh, about 60% at about four uh, sessions until they are approved. So just interesting to look at. And, and as I said, I wanted to explore a bit the user session to see uh, uh, what kind of features is it worth to build from this data. Um, so I looked at an example of a user. Now, as I said, I'm focusing on the user we had to decide manually about because the models cannot uh, uh, decide about them. They were uh, problematic uh, examples. And this is an example of the user inside the uh, gray area, which is also a bit more problematic. Uh, we had to go back and forth with him and ask a bit more data from him. So. Uh, is an interesting example. It took, him so, it took us a bit time to, to approve it, but we did in the end. Uh, and I just want to show you how does the data look like. So this user starts on 6th of October, and it just goes into Blue, Blue Vine website, uh, looks at the line of credit. Uh, then one day after, he starts the wizard, but don't finish it. And uh, then uh, uh, the third session is four days after. Uh, he finally finished the wizard and did it all through, and it took him 30 minutes. And uh, then on the same day, he's checking what happened with his application. Is he approved? Is he approved? Uh, um, but probably not yet, because uh, one hour later, uh, here another session, he's just browsing through the pages, still not approved. And then another hour later, another session. And then uh, on the seventh session, he got some tasks uh, from our team. Uh, and then uh, two days later, he was approved by us. So this was just uh, to give you a hunch of how this data feels like. Uh, and now let's go to build some features. So as I said, uh, I, I recognize the different session of a user, and I want to characterize them. I want to look at the duration of the different sessions, at the number of pages the user visits between the different sessions, uh, and the total number of sessions the user did until it was approved or rejected. And uh, I wanted to look specifically at the wizard. How long did it take the user to do different stages in the wizard? Um, so, for example, one of the features I developed was the median session duration. Uh, and how can I do that? Uh, I just took uh, my data frame, I grew by a class, it's just one I want to predict, um, the user and the session number. Um, then I took the timestamp and I took the maximal timestamp for each session and uh, decreased from it the minimum uh, timestamp for each session. And what I get there uh, is for each user, for each session, the duration of this session. And now I can build many features out of it. Uh, for example, median or minimum or maximum uh, of a session duration. Uh, so. On this, uh, as I said, I just uh, uh, build uh, the median session duration. And this is what we see here. For each user, we have uh, the uh, median session duration. Now I want to understand whether this feature actually has some meaning to us, whether it has some connection uh, with what we want to predict. So uh, I used the ANOVA statistical test to understand that. Uh, and I just did a box plot of the median session duration of the approved user and of the rejected users. And what we can see here, that uh, the approved user looked like it takes them a, 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 a shorter time uh, to do the different session. The median session duration is smaller uh, in general for the approved users. So that's a very interesting result. Interesting to think why. 
Uh, and uh, in order to really see if the, there is a, a statistical difference between the group, I use uh, the ANOVA test, as I said, uh, which estimated the degree of dependency between the feature and the target. And I got a p-value which is very small, so there probably is a dependency here. So I took that as a feature. Now, uh, an example of another interesting feature I looked at is the number of pages the user visited in the shortest session. Meaning like in the example that we saw, after the user finished the wizard, he came into our website and just checked one page in the website, just check if he's approved. So for, for him, for example, this uh, feature would be one because the minimal number of pages he had in a sequence is one. So this actually means um, uh, what is the what is the shortest session of a, of a user? So what I did it's very simple. Again, group by by the user and session num, and just uh, calculate the length of the sequence um, using this apply here. Uh, and then uh, on that on all the uh, sessions length, I just took the minimum here. And, and then again, I wanted to check the connection uh, of this feature with my target, which is whether the user was approved or rejected. And again, we can see an interesting connection here. The rejected user has shorter uh, sessions. They had, uh, it's, it sounds like uh, counterintuitive, like, like uh, uh, as opposed to what we saw before, but it's actually something different because the user has a few sessions. Before we saw that the median session duration was longer for rejected users. But what we see here is that most of the rejected user has one very short session, okay? So it's something different. Uh, and it also has correlation with our target, as we can see here from the p-value of the ANOVA test. Um, so these are two examples of session features I used. I used uh, more. And other if interesting features I used is which URLs the user visited at all. Because we have uh, some URLs in our websites, and you don't have to visit all of them in order to do the wizard and apply. Um, so what I did is just take all of the URLs and uh, using group by and then value counts on the URL field. Uh, and then uh, I did this cool uh, unstack thing, which takes uh, uh, the rows and makes them into columns. Um, I created a binary features for each URL, whether the user uh, uh, visited or not. Uh, and then I didn't use all the URLs I have. I just took the ones that had some correlation with my target and also the ones that appear enough times in my data in order to prevent from overfeeding. Uh, so this is another uh, interesting feature I tried and I used in the end. Um, other interesting features I used are how many times the user visited in our website and in our app uh, uh, until he was approved or rejected. And also sequences of URLs uh, as the user uh, visited. As I said before, uh, it was one of the insights from the Markov chain analysis that the sequence matter. It's interesting to see whether the user visited this URL and then another, or this URL and then another. It, it makes sense. Uh, to see the, the user flow. So uh, these are more features. And now uh, for the final uh, uh, step, before I get to the model, I wanted to talk to you a bit about data leakage. Because in this kind of project, which is very open, you have to be really aware of this issue of data leakage. Now, what does data leakage mean? It means that you have in your data information that will not be available in the real world. Now, in fact, if you have this kind of information in your data, your model will be ruined because it will learn the wrong things you wanted to learn. It will learn something that will not be there on real life, and then it will just fail on real life. Uh, so I'm trying to be very careful of it. Um, and uh, I thought about it, that uh, I use many features that might be correlated with the time we have to the decisions. I look, for example, at the number of sessions the user did until uh, she, he or she was approved, right? And if it takes a different time for the user to be approved than, uh, than to reject it, then it, this might be correlated with the number of sessions the user does, right? I mean, if it, uh, we take a long time to approve you, then maybe you get uh, more sessions in our website. 
So I checked this out, and actually what I saw is that really it does take more time uh, to be approved uh, than uh, to be rejected. So I had to be very careful about that when engineering my features. Also, notice here that we have this little box of auto decisions. Uh, well, these are the users I just eliminated from my model because, as I said, I wanted to focus in the gray area, the ones we decide about manually. Uh, so now, how do I eliminate the time issue from my features? So for example, um, if I look at the number of sessions the user did, uh, it's uh, mildly correlated with the time to decision. It's not very strong, but, but of course, it, it has to be correlated logically. Uh, so what I did in order to eliminate that, it just take uh, the number of sessions in the first 24 hours and not uh, in the uh, total uh, uh, sessions of the user, just the session he did in the first 24 hours. And that was good enough for me, it eliminated the correlation, so uh, we got our result. And I also did it for other features I had, which, was, uh, which were um, uh, connected somehow to the time to approval. Uh, and now to the last stage, uh, creating a model and analyzing its results. So what can we see here? Uh, this is the feature importance. Unfortunately, I don't think you can actually read <laughs> what, what's uh, here. Um, we can see here in the middle uh, the rock curve, the true positive rate versus the false positive rate. And of course, our goal is for this thing to be as high up in the left side as we can, uh, up above the random guess. And we have the probabilities there from the right, which we want to be spread as possible between the classes. And we can see here pretty amazing results. We can predict the decision uh, over risk without using any of the features the risk does. I mean, that's amazing, right? Um, well, actually, not that much. I mean, you can see it here, but uh, the most strong feature uh, uh, which I had in my model, it's a very interesting feature. It says uh, uh, whether the user visited in this two sequence, two length sequence, which is uh, the two pages of setting files and then login. Now, what does it mean? Um, it means that we asked from the user to add more files. So, in effect, this reflects some of the risk decision. These are th these two pages only get to user which we weren't sure about from the first place. So, in fact, it somehow uh, reflects the the risk decision, a part of it, uh, in this feature. So, um, I decided to just remove all features that are connected uh, to this uh, from my model, and then uh, create a the model again. And as you can see now, it's less amazing than one we, saw, one we saw before. Before it was 78% rock, and now we see 68. Uh, but this is, this is more uh, logical. I mean, uh, I looked at some research in this topic, and this is pretty much aligned with the industry st standards. So that's cool. And we can see that the interesting features, well, you can see, but I can see, that the interesting features are uh, the, the time it took the user to uh, uh, fill the financial form in the wizard. This one is mo most influential here. We can also see the second one is the one I showed you, the minimum number pages in sequence, the shortest sequence the user had, like if the user checked whether it was approved in our website. Then we can see uh, the wizard duration, how long it take him to do all the wizard, and the number of sessions the user did. Um, so that's uh, very interesting. Uh, another, uh, just a small thing I wanted to show you, I don't have much time, so in a minute. Uh, I did some analysis on my model decisions user using Lime. Uh, Lime is a really cool uh, tool which helps you open up the black box of the model. Uh, so I won't go into it, but if you have a question about it, we can talk about it later. Um, and to summarize, uh, we can learn a lot from clickstream data, and it's really fun to use all great Pandas features to, to work with this kind of very complex data. And, and be aware of data leakage, and analyze your models, and understand whether they uh, come to their uh, decisions from the right uh, directions. And that's it.